Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudy Schlaf, a professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. This is part one of the energy storage segment. We will discuss the intermittence of sustainable energy sources. Then we will start discussing electrostatic and chemical energy storage. The subtopics are capacitors, supercapacitors and batteries. Hydrogen storage and fuel cells will be discussed in part two. Let's first talk about the electric power grid as it is implemented right now. The power grid is real time, so there's almost no energy storage capacity built in. Only 2.4% of the electric power capacity in the US are backed up by storage, and that's mostly via hydro storage. Historically, storage was not really a focus because fossil fuel power plants can be run with high prediction. The output can be adjusted as needed. This is typically done using uh, historic data. So last year will be similar like this year type of things. And then they also use statistical evaluation of weather patterns and temperatures and so forth, trying to predict how much power is needed. And then the power plants are adjusted to provide that estimated base load for a given hour of the day. Short-term spikes in electricity needs are typically met with gas-fired power plants, which can change the output very quickly because it is much easier to regulate a gas fire than a coal fire or a nuclear reactor. Here you see a schematic of the power grid. Essentially we have power plants and then we have end users that are connected via a system of metal wires. And in these wires the power plant provides the current that is sunk into the individual end users devices that are connected to the grid. So the entire process is immediate. If someone turns on a switch at the end users location then the current need increases in the network and the power plants will step up their power output to match that requested power at the end user's location. The disadvantage of course of this process is that if a power plant fails or some wires disconnect in the grid then the lights at the end users will go off immediately. There is nothing that can mediate such issues except by rerouting power from other power plants that are still online. This current grid structure is not suitable for renewable energy sources because these are intermittent. Here in this graph you see a comparison between a typical output of a wind power plant and a fossil fuel power plant. So here they plot the output power versus the time and a fossil fuel power plant can essentially output the rated power in a constant way over time. So the energy that's coming out of the power plant is the full area under the power curve. In the case of a wind power plant or a solar power plant, we have this intermittence and that means that the rated output power is almost never met. And this means that the output energy, the area under the power curve, is much less than in the case of a fossil fuel or nuclear power plant. Because of this intermittence, it is difficult to match the need curve with the power output curve of renewable energy power plants. You see this here. This here is actual data from Denmark in January 2000. So down here, this is the output from their wind power plants and up here this is the actual power need that was measured during this period. So you see that every day has a repeating pattern of power need. Now the wind doesn't care about that and so we need some way to mitigate between the energy that's coming from the wind and the energy that is actually needed at the end users. Other reasons for energy storage are of course portability for transportation applications if we all want electric cars, then we need to find better batteries that have a higher energy density, which would allow to improve the mileage of electrical cars. This would also open up applications in the aviation field, because planes, of course, need very light batteries to improve the payload. 
This graph shows the degree of utilization of various sustainable energy technologies, including nuclear. What you see here is that nuclear and coal is similar. They have about 85% degree of utilization, so 15% of the time the plant is shut down and 85% of the time it is running at full output. When you look at hydro, wind, solar, wave, marine currents and geothermal, only geothermal is actually as good as nuclear and the reason of course for that is that the heat underground is constant and so these power plants can also run in a constant way. But everything else has a degree of utilization that is substantially smaller than 85%. This means that all these technologies would benefit from energy storage technology. One can probably say that energy storage is probably the most significant barrier to a full-scale renewable energy use. There are a number of energy storage technologies. We can group them into chemical, electrostatic, magnetic and mechanical. Among the chemical ones are batteries, supercapacitors, fuel cells and flow batteries. Electrostatic magnetic include regular capacitors and we will also talk about superconducting magnetic energy storage where energy is stored in a current that goes around in a superconducting ring. Among the mechanical energy storage technologies there are pumped hydro storage. This is the one that is currently used for most of these 2.4% uh, in the US grid. Then there are compressed air, there are flywheels, and there is of course thermal energy storage, which is basically just random kinetic energy that is stored in a thermal reservoir. In the following we will discuss these technologies, and I want to start out here with electrostatic and chemical storage. When it comes to storing electrostatic potential energy, that is electricity, it helps to remember the generator. You saw this slide already in the solar energy segment. So what a generator does is it takes electrons from a low energy level and it shovels them over to an energy level that is higher. And then when we connect the load, the electrons go through the load back to the lower level. And so the generator just keeps this going. And so we can drive our load, perform work in it with these electrons. If we want to store the electrons at high energy, then we need an energy storage device. And the capacitor is the most simple device that can do that. In a capacitor we have two plates that are at a certain distance away from each other to prevent a current flowing directly between the plates. And then we can hook up our generator to these plates and the generator will pump electrons on one side and on the other side we will have a lack of electrons. So we can think of this as a positive charge or what we know now from semiconductors. We can also think of this as holes that are on the positive plate. So the generator keeps pumping electrons and the electrons go on this plate and on the other side we have a lack of electrons because this is where the electrons came from. So we have a situation where the electrons are at the high energy level and the holes are on a low energy level. If we replace the generator with a load, then the electrons they can flow back through the load to the positive plate and recombine with those holes and so the whole thing becomes neutral again after the energy is dispensed. In this graph it would mean the electrons they roll down the hill and they find the positive charges and then they recombine with them. So it's obvious a capacitor needs to be rated by the number of electrons that we can put on there at a certain voltage that the generator creates. Each generator has a capability to lift electron up by a certain amount of energy which is proportional to the voltage that the generator outputs. So this capacity of a capacitor to be able to accept electrons depending on the voltage that is called the capacitance. And so capacitance is simply defined how many electrons can we put per voltage, how much charge can we put on it per voltage. So in geometrical terms one can also express the capacitance as this quotient here where we divide the dielectric constant of the medium in between the plates 
times the area of the plates divided by the distance of the plates. So distance d, that is this d in this equation. So the capacitance is essentially a constant multiplied by the area divided by the distance. So it's very simple. If you want a capacitor that has a high capacitance that allows us to store a lot of electrons, a lot of energy in it, we need to make it large. A large area helps and we need to make the distance as small as we can. So we go to this scenario, we reduce the distance and out of a sudden we can squeeze many more electrons on it and of course we have more holes on this side. Why is that the case? Why does reducing the distance help this process? Well, it's pretty obvious if you think of it. The positive charges here, they attract the negative charges we have on this side. And so the electrical field that is between the positive and the negative charges helps the generator to put electrons on this plate. And so if we make the distance smaller, the electrical field gets stronger and so we suck more electrons on there and the generator has to work less. So at a certain voltage we can get more electrons on the plate and that means we store more energy on it. So larger capacitance means we can store more energy at a given voltage on the capacitor. This formula gives the energy that's on the capacitor. That's just one half times the capacitance times the voltage squared. So you see when the capacitance gets larger we can store more energy in the capacitor depending on the voltage. We can also express that with the number of charges that we have on the capacitor. So the energy is just one half times the voltage times the charges that are on the uh, plates. So we know now that the capacitance depends crucially on the distance between the two plates. The smaller the distance, the larger the capacitance. So the best capacitor would be two atomically smooth plates held in a distance d that is just of atomic proportions. Now of course this is not a practical approach for making a cheap capacitor and so the practical approach is to use two metal foils and stick an insulating sheet in between and then you can roll up this assembly and put it in a can and make a capacitor out of it. Now the effect of the material that we put in between this insulator, the so-called dielectric, is that it polarizes and it forms new capacitors. We have one capacitor between the negative plate and the positive charges on one side of this insulator. And we have a capacitor here between the positive charges on the plate and the negative charges in the polarized insulator. And then we have a third capacitor that is between the positive charges on this end and the negative charges on that end of the insulator. So what we have is a circuit where three capacitors are connected in series. Because the gap here is really small, right? we can squeeze this together as hard as we want. So we get very effective capacitors between the plates and the insulator. So these two capacitors are large and then we have a smaller capacitor inside the dielectric. The capacitance of this capacitor depends on the dielectric constant of the dielectric. The dielectric constant, the larger it is, the more polarization we get inside the dielectric. That means more positive and negative charges we get separated inside the, the insulator. If we want to calculate the total capacitance of capacitors that are connected in series, you need to add up the reciprocal values of the capacitances and then take the reciprocal value of this added up number. So it's immediately obvious that large capacitances, if you say 1 divided by a large number, you get something small. And if you divide 1 by a smaller number, you get something larger. Typically, one can completely neglect the capacitances on the outside and the final capacitance of a capacitor with dielectric is dominated by the capacitance of the dielectric that is inside the capacitor. This is unfortunate, but it is the most practical approach to making capacitors because it is easy to fabricate. Let's consider how we can improve the capacitance of a dielectric capacitor. Essentially, we have our two parameters, the dielectric constant and the distance d. So we could, of course, make a really thin dielectric 
and that would increase the capacitance. But this would not be practical because at some point current would start leaking through and we would also get a low breakthrough voltage so this capacitor could only be used for very low voltages. Now what's left is to try to make the dielectric constant large. The best dielectric capacitor would be one where the dielectric constant is infinite because then we would get a really large capacitor in here and we would at least get the two pretty good capacitors that we have between the plates and the dielectric on either side. So we would get a structure like this. A material with a dielectric constant that is infinite, unfortunately that is a metal. And so we would not have gained anything. We would actually, in comparison to just putting two ultra smooth metal plates as close together as possible, we would have divided our capacitance by two. Because if you put two capacitors of the same value in series, then you get half the value. If you do the math, this is immediately obvious. So metal, of course, we cannot use. That doesn't help us because it is conductive. But we can approximate a structure like that by putting an electrolytic liquid in between the plates. And an electrolytic liquid is a liquid that has positive and negative charges in there as ions. And these ions can move inside the liquid. They can separate very effectively because they can move freely inside the liquid, which is not the case with the electrons and the protons in a solid state dielectric where we can only polarize individual atoms and try to build up a charge difference between the two sides. Let's talk briefly about electrolytes. The definition of electrolyte is that it is a solution of ions. So we have a liquid and we have some ions in there. Such solutions are conductive since the ions can move under the influence of an electrical field inside the liquid. That makes this different from a solid state dielectric where the negative and positive charges are fixed in the atomic lattice that makes up the dielectric. It's very easy to make an electrolyte. All we have to do is put an ionic compound, AB, into a polar solvent. So the easiest case is to put some table salt into water. Salt is just sodium chloride. Sodium forms the positive A ions and chlorine forms the negative B ions. So in the solid state, a and B are in the crystal in an alternating fashion in order to keep the whole thing neutral. So once you put it into water, make a solution out of it, the polarized water molecules descend on these AB combinations and the attraction between the water molecules, the positive end with the negative ion and the negative ends with the positive ions, is so strong that it forces the ions A and B apart from each other and each gets surrounded by water molecules. We see that here. This process is called hydration when the solvent is water. And so the positive ions, they have water molecules around them where the negative end of the water molecule, the oxygen, is pointing towards the ion and the negative ions have, the, have water molecules around them where the hydrogens, the positive end of these molecules, points towards the ion. So after this process, the positive and negative ions are separated in the solution by this layer of water molecules around them. This means once we apply a voltage between two electrodes in the electrolyte, the positive ions, right, the entire structure here has a positive charge still, and here the entire structure has a negative charge. And so this here would get drawn towards the positive electrode and this here would get drawn towards the negative electrodes. And this is what's happening in an electrolytic capacitor when we apply a voltage to it. The positive and negative ions separate. Here you see it schematically. This is a bipolar electrolytic capacitor. So what we have is this reservoir with the electrolyte and we put two electrodes in there and they have a thin oxide layer on them and then we have here the hydrated ions and so we have negative ones and positive ones now when we apply a voltage right here this is without voltage so they just move around freely brown's motion when we apply a voltage what happens is they separate and the negative ones go to the positive electrode and the positive ones go to the negative ones and so you see here we have two beautiful capacitors with a very thin insulator in between. 
and that is the effective distance of this of this capacitor. So this is just a couple or three atomic layers thick on an aluminum electrode and so this makes a really nice and big capacitor with a high capacitance. The problem again is that we have two capacitors in series here so we have a scenario like this and you know now that in this case we only get half the capacitance out of the setup that we could have if we just had one of these electrodes. We just saw that in a bipolar electrolytic capacitor we lose half of the capacitance because the two capacitors at the electrodes are in series. By removing the oxide layer on one of the electrodes we can increase the capacitance on that electrode dramatically. Typically one gets a factor of 50 to 100 because the distance between the effective capacitor plates is now much smaller. So in this scenario we have one large capacitor in series with a smaller capacitor. And you know now because we have to add the reciprocals of the capacitances, the small one dominates the capacitance of the entire assembly. If we have a factor of 50 to 100, this here only contributes about 1% of the capacitance. And so essentially what we get here is this capacitance as the capacitance of the entire capacitor. So the bottom line with this design is that at least we get the total capacitance of the capacitor that forms on one of the plates. We doubled the capacitance relative to the bipolar design. The disadvantage of polar electrolytic capacitors, however, is that one can only use them in one polarity. If one would reverse the polarity here, make this positive and this side negative, electrochemical reactions between the electrolyte and the electrode would dissolve the oxygen layer, which would cause a current to flow through the entire device and electrolysis of the electrolyte would occur, which would form a gas inside the capacitor can, which would finally lead to its explosion. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could also remove the oxide layer here and then get this capacitance as big as this one, and so we could get this factor 50 to 100, or at least half of that in capacitance increase. This is done in supercapacitors or ultracapacitors. Here you see it, a supercapacitor. The oxide layers are gone, and that has the consequence that once we apply a voltage to it, the electrons can actually move between the ions and the plates. And so the negatively charged plate shoots electrons into the positively charged ions, while on the positive side, the negative charge from the ions enters the plates. And so we have a real current between the electrolyte and the electrodes. This is called a Faraday current. This is the main reason for the high capacitance of these capacitors. We can think of it as having reduced the distance d between positive and negative charges to a dimension that is smaller than an atom. So each atom contains one of the charges and this is the maximum charge density that one can achieve. Since there is no more oxide layer, we need to be aware of potential chemical reactions. Chemical reactions between the ions and the electrodes are prevented by using materials for the electrodes that are chemically inert, such as carbon or, or graphite. Another issue is electrochemical dissociation of the electrolyte, because we can now pass charges from the electrodes onto molecules that are in the electrolyte. Let's say if the electrolyte is made from water, we can cause electrolysis and electrolysis typically occurs at voltages higher than 1.6 volts. This means that these capacitors can only be operated at voltages that are smaller than the dissociation voltage of the electrolyte. So in the case of an aqueous electrolyte, this would be a limit of about 1.6 volts. This here shows a schematic of a supercapacitor. Typically, the electrodes are made from a porous structure. Very popular is so-called activated carbon. That is carbon that was made porous by a high temperature process. This maximizes the surface of the capacitor. One gram of such activated carbon may have a surface area of the order of 500 square meters. 
in between the two electrodes there is typically a spacer which is insulating to separate them electrically but that is also porous to ions so the ions can travel from one electrode to the other which is necessary for these capacitors to operate. This is a scanning electron microscopy image of activated carbon and so you see here this porous structure that occurs. The very best materials can achieve up to 3000 square meters per gram of surface area. The fabrication is usually achieved by heating the carbon either without oxygen or with oxygen. In the case of oxidation the temperature can be lower and the pores are created by loss of carbon because carbon dioxide is formed. This table shows some specs of supercapacitors. The first row shows the rated capacitance. They come in at 45,000 or 80,000 farads. This is a huge capacitance in comparison to standard electrolytic capacitors where even fairly big cans can have tens or maybe a hundred millifarad. These here are 1.6 liters so they are pretty big but clearly this is a very high capacitance for a volume uh, of this magnitude. Now the rated voltage, we already discussed that. It's only 1.6 volts or 1.7 volts, so clearly here we take a hit when it comes to the amount of energy that can be stored on these capacitors. But still, since we have so many magnitudes, more capacitance on these capacitors per volume, the amount of energy that can be stored in these capacitors is still several magnitudes higher than in regular capacitors per volume. One distinguishing factor is the cycle life of supercapacitors. They have only a hundred thousand or this one here has more than ten thousand cycles. This is in stark contrast to standard electrolytic capacitors where we can say they have an almost infinite cycle life. Clearly supercapacitors are much closer to batteries in their lifetime. Batteries also can only be charged and decharged a number of times before they have to be replaced. You know that from your laptop battery or batteries in a power tool or in a car, after a certain number of cycles they have to be replaced. Regular capacitors, in contrast, have an almost infinite lifetime. We know now that the high energy density in supercapacitors comes from the fact that electrons really go on the ions that are in the electrolyte. This enables a very high charge density on the electrodes of supercapacitors and therefore we can get more energy on them. Now this concept is driven further in batteries. There we keep the current going and we are able to build up layer after layer of neutralized ions on the electrodes. And this is what explains the even higher energy density of batteries. So as long as there are ions in the electrolyte, when we keep the current going, a thicker and thicker layer builds up on the electrodes. And so during the charging process, the ions are being neutralized. So the ion B goes from negative to neutral by putting an electron into the, the circuit and the electron is then stored on A by neutralizing the positive charge that was on A. When the battery is fully charged, ideally all the ions in the electrolyte have formed a neutral film on either of the electrodes depending on whether they are A or B. This charging reverses this process electrons would be released from A and then it would, they would go through the circuit and end up on B and the ions would return into the electrolyte and the deposited layers would shrink and the battery would be empty once all ions are back in the solution. It's interesting to look into what defines the voltage of a battery. As in all storage devices for electrostatic energy, we need a high and a low energy level. And in a battery, these energy levels are defined by the ionization energies of the entities A and B that are in the electrolyte. So when the battery is fully charged, all the electrons are on the molecules or atoms A, 
and they neutralized them and so they are deposited on the electrode so we had electrons going onto this fairly high energy level on A and during the discharge process the electrons will go into the electrode and then go through the load and they will end up on the lower energy level on the molecule or atom B and will make it a negative ion while A is a positive ion after this process is completed. So the voltage of a battery is defined by the difference between these two ionization energies, which defines the difference between the low and the high energy levels. Here on this slide we see the example of a lithium ion battery. Lithium ion batteries are probably the most important batteries right now for mobile applications because of their relatively high energy density in comparison to other commercially available battery types. That makes cars with a fairly high range possible without having to go to excessive weight. This battery is somewhat special in comparison to other battery systems since only one of the two ions that are in the electrolyte participates in the battery action. So the counter ion, some negative ion, is not participating in the battery. The battery is only using the lithium ions for the charging and discharging process. Lithium ion batteries have on one electrode the negative pole or the anode. They have porous carbon on the electrodes. So porous carbon we know now is an inert material and that means that lithium that intercalates into the pores of this carbon is only weakly bonded. On the other side we have what's called a layered lithium spinel. So this is a crystal that has lithium intercalated in between layers of some other atoms. And the lithium in this situation is more strongly bonded. That means it has a lower energy. So this gives us a high energy level on this side and a low energy level on this side on the positive end of the battery. And this is what we need in a battery a high energy level and a low energy level. When the battery is full, most of the lithium is in the porous carbon and the spinel has been depleted. This is possible because we applied a, a power supply to this battery which allowed us to transport electrons from the cathode into the anode and neutralize lithium ions inside the porous carbon. The charging process involves taking off electrons of the intercalated lithium on the spinel side, which releases the lithium as lithium ions into the electrolyte and pumping the electrons over to the porous carbon end, where the electrons go back on the lithium ions as they intercalate into the porous carbon. But because of their weak interaction with the porous carbon, this is not a stable situation. So as soon as we remove the power supply from the battery and connect a load instead, thereby creating a path for the electrons back to the cathode, this process is reversed. The lithium atoms that are inside the porous carbon they immediately shed their electron and they go back into solution and the electrons go over to the cathode where the availability of the electrons draws the lithium ions back into the spinel and intercalates them in between these layers and that is the discharge process. So the battery is fully discharged once all the lithium ions are again neutral inside the spinel. It's interesting to look into what would happen if lithium ion batteries would become the energy storage of choice for our societies. They are currently the best batteries in terms of energy density and lifetime, so they're very attractive for electrical cars. With any large-scale deployment of technology, one needs to look into the resources that are necessary for this deployment. When it comes to lithium, there is a limited supply. The current world production is about 75,000 tons of lithium carbonate and one estimates that the recoverable carbonate reserve is about 35 megatons. Now this number comes from only Salt Lake based resources. 
75% of these resources are in South America and half of it in Bolivia. You see that here in this pie chart, this is where the main lithium deposits are found worldwide. And so you see that the US only have a very small amount of this total lithium amount. So one could think of it as replacing dependence on foreign oil with some degree of dependence on foreign lithium if one would go large-scale electric car. Now it should be said that lithium can also be attracted from the oceans, but this is more expensive because it is very dilute. This study tried to estimate the need for lithium depending on the number of hybrid vehicles that are put in service every year. So they are using the uh, Prius as the prototypical example of current hybrid technology and then they also came up with a hypothetical PHEV20 which is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that can travel 20 miles on an electric charge. The Prius cannot, its battery is used for regenerative braking mainly. So here in this graph, the projected lithium need for certain numbers of these cars is compared with the 2005 lithium carbonate production. And so the reds and the blue bars are the minimum and the maximum estimate of the numbers in comparison. So I put that blue dotted line to create a benchmark for the 2005 uh, lithium carbonate production level. And so we see here that 1 million Priuses would need this barely visible sliver of that lithium carbonate. If we would convert those to 20 miles per charge vehicles, 1 million of them would have this now much stronger sliver of lithium need. And if we would go to 17 million Priuses, then of course we get 17 times this here, so the bar gets larger and 17 million of the 20 mile plug-in hybrids, they would then surpass the current lithium production. So if we wanted to go this route and have 17 million of 20 mile hybrids produced per year and outfit them with the necessary batteries, we would have to more than double the current lithium production. And keep in mind that most of this lithium right now does not go into cars. So it goes into other uh, batteries for laptops and power tools and whatnot. So it's clear if we want to ramp up electric car production and use lithium ion batteries, then something needs to happen with the annual lithium production. So here this bar shows what happens if we go to 60 million cars per year. This is essentially the, the current annual production of vehicles. You see that we have probably a factor 8 or so of the current lithium need for this type of production output for of electrical cars. In this study by Jaksik and Tilton, they estimated how the price of lithium carbonate would evolve as we tap more and more of those 30 million tons of lithium that are available in Salt Lake based deposits. And so as we go here up the tons, the small steps in price, they come from having to switch salt lakes essentially. There are some salt lakes that are easier to access or where the lithium is in a form that is easier to extract. And so we work our way up here through the uh, resources and we go from easy access to more difficult access. And like with oil and fracking and so forth, the price is going up as it gets more difficult to extract the resource. They estimate that in 2100, we would be at this point assuming that we have a full conversion of the fleet to lithium-based uh, hybrids with a 9 kilowatt hour battery and 9 million people on the planet, 3 people per car in a 10 year lifetime of a car and 80% recycling of the lithium. So, so this is the curve that can be predicted. And so as the 30 million tons are reached, which marks the end of lithium that can be extracted from Salt Lake based deposits and one has to switch to seawater extraction and there the price shoots up because the lithium is very dilute in seawater and this means a harder effort will occur to extract the lithium. The red and the blue curves, they mark the minimum and maximum estimates for these scenarios.
this may seem as a strong price increase, and it is. It is several hundred percent towards the end of the Salt Lake-based lithium, and when the switch to seawater occurs. But it also needs to be viewed in relation to the price of the entire battery. A 9 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery currently has 6.7 kilograms of lithium at a price of about $42 in it. So even if we have a five-fold price increase, this wouldn't change much the price of such a battery, which currently is at around $5,000. So it would only be a few percent of that total price. Of course, price is not everything. When it comes to any large-scale technology, environmental issues need to be considered. Most salt lakes are in pristine, remote, high-altitude areas, and high-altitude areas are always very sensitive to disturbance, and it takes a long time until they recover. So this is something to be considered once we approach 100% extraction from salt lakes. Another consideration is once lithium will get extracted from seawater that large land areas will need to be used for evaporation ponds to get the lithium. This concludes part one of the Energy Storage segment. Thanks for watching.